Welcome to Pause for the Truth, where you can sit back, relax, and hear an honest dialogue about health, wealth, legal, and social issues. The hosts are Dr. Rogers Kane, family practice physician, and Jocelyn Turner, health education consultant, with co-hosts from the Northeast Florida Medical Society and its foundation. Stay tuned for the truth about matters affecting you and your family. We're here to tell you what's really going on and why. Good evening and welcome to Pause for the Truth. I am your co-host, Jocelyn Turner. It's a beautiful evening in Northeast Florida. I am your co-host, Jocelyn Turner. Haven't heard it's in winter in most places where it's snowing. Haven't heard. Oh, I wonder what it's a wrong winter. It sounded very scary. Haven't heard. Oh, I wonder what it's a wrong winter. It sounded very scary. Yeah, someone's got a. I'm a mute Hold on a second. Yeah, someone's got a. Someone's got the show on. Yeah, someone's got a. Someone's got the show on. with us for a moment. All right, I filled out all everything going on in the background. That was weird. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure what that is. I know. Well, how about I start over again? I am Jocelyn Turner, your co-host. Welcome to Pause for the Truth. Dr. Kane, I don't know about you. Is it because of our topic tonight? Is it that hot, man? What is going on here? <laughs> I'm all good for the day. I mean, I thought it was pretty much a, uh, a beautiful day in terms of the weather. It might have been a little chilly for some, but, you know, it, it was pasta for me. So <laughs> I'm all good. I'm just, that's never happened, Tyrone, our technology uh, expert. What happened is because we're talking about diver the challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion, did it get out in the atmosphere and somebody's trying to sabotage us? What's going on? Well, you know, they've always told us that the devil's always busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. Well, we are super delighted this evening to have a uh, if you haven't heard, for those of you who are not local or know about the happenings, the going-ons, the history of Northeast Florida, well, you have a treat because we have a celebrity, a local celebrity um, as a guest for tonight. And I am super delighted to welcome Mr. Rodney Lawrence Hurst, Sr. Did I get it right, Mr. Hurst? You most certainly did, Ms. Turner. And she had to call you out, Lawrence. Huh? Yeah, she did. She gave me, she called my oh, government, my government, government name. The whole government name, right? Government uh, name. And also, yes. <laughs> also joining us this evening is my favorite surgeon, Dr. Kenneth W. Jones. How are you doing, Dr. Jones? Good evening. I'm well. Yes. Everyone Wonderful. else. Looks welcome, a welcome, nice welcome. Dr. Jones. Yes, indeed. Hi there. It's a it's evening, a beautiful Rodney. day. Dr. Jones, we were having some technical issues before you logged on. I was teasing, saying that's never happened. Is it because we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Did it get out in the atmosphere or what? It's a CIA <laughs> conspiracy. I <laughs> uh, know. Well, um, again, in all seriousness, we are we are talking about the challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm going to start with Mr. Hurst by first saying, Mr. Hurst, I always look at diversity as what a wonderful opportunity to have a variety of people around to get a variety of experiences, 
learn a lot from different types of folks, get different perspectives. Why are people so challenged today by diversity, equity, and inclusion? All right, Mr. Hirsch, before you answer that, let me say one thing. I want to let all our viewers know that we are back and you can call in to the show with your questions live. Well, Ms. Jocelyn, we'll be posting at a time where you can call in and we're excited about, we're very, very excited about that. So I just wanted to let you know two real big important things. We also have it now where you can go directly to our website and watch us live. You don't have to go to YouTube. You don't have to go anywhere. Everything is right there on pause for the truth. You take it away, Mr. Hurst. <laughs> Thank you, Tyrone. White folk came up with the name diversity, equity, and inclusion because they are not that threatening. Mm. Then after they came up with the name and when there was this expansiveness and the inclusion to make sure all folk were included, then they, uh, in effect, demonized the words. So in demonizing diversity, equity, and inclusion, when two or three years ago, those words were the best thing since sliced bread. Your corporations and other businesses, they talked about, oh, we've got to have diversified customer base and diversified employees, mm -hmm. and we've got to include everyone. We've got to believe in equity. Well, that's where we were right after the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. Everyone bought into the fact that, yeah, we need to diversify. We need to uh, show equity for everyone and include. And then white folk came up with the term reverse discrimination because somehow they felt that if you included black folk, that was taking something away from them. So if they did not have the entire cake, then they did not want to share that with anyone. The problem with diversity, equity, and inclusion is that the fact that it was demonized and is being demonized politically, it just a political layout for those racist elected officials who feel like if who feel as if they uh, can plug into, and many of them can, can plug into that river, that very toxic river of racism that continually flows in this country, and they can somehow walk up the political ladder as a result of that, while they are also saying, in effect, they don't believe in the equality of all people, which is where we were well before the Civil Rights Bill and when we talk about things like the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, we are retrogressing because of core racist attitudes in this country. And that's the problem with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Racist, racist elected officials, white racist elected officials have taken those words and embraced them to demonize them for their political effect. And they feel like it helps them as they run for elective office. Wow. Dr. Jones, what are your thoughts on that? Well, mine goes back to the time when we realized, I'm, I'll stick mainly with the academic components of it. We realized in the United States that one, no matter how much money was being spent, that African-Americans were not benefiting from the what we're seeing in the healthcare arena. So everyone did the analysis, most African-Americans knew, is that we needed more black doctors. So then medical schools said, you know what? Our classes are 99% or 100% non-black. Let's make sure that we recruit African-Americans to come to our medical school. Then subsequently, what did the Supreme give us? They gave us the Bakke decision. Right. And that says that the use of race in the selection process in medical schools was illegal. Mm -hmm. Understanding fully well the reason why healthcare for black people was worse is because there were no black doctors. Right. It's not that they didn't have doctors. Right. There were no black doctors. And we know the data is well-founded. The healthcare of African-Americans 
improve and are better when that community is served by black doctors. There's no question about it today. So when now we transition from reverse discrimination to the DEI issue, the DEI issue today is being used. Remember Willie Horton at the last election many years ago? Many people listening to this may be too young to know it. They vilified. They used that racist trope to win elections. So now we've gone to DEI as a way to make white people feel uncomfortable and say, well, then I need to vote for this guy because, you know, he's trying to protect my back. It has nothing to do with that. All this says is that historically, we never recruited black people. There are lots of highly educated black people that we should recruit. And that's all DEI has done for us. They didn't give us a pass. You know, um, somebody commented on the fact that United and American were trying to increase the number of black pilots. They went negative on that. One person in particular who sells cars. And what that person needs to understand, there's no black pilots test. Mm -hmm. Just like in medical school, there is no black test. Right. You take the state boards, whether you're black, blue, purple, or white, and you have to pass it. I mean, we have documentation. Blacks graduate at a higher rate from Harvard, from Princeton, than Caucasians do. Well, if these people were not qualified, they would not even be graduating. It was published in Forbes, in Forbes magazine, well-written article. People seem to kind of throw that into the garbage when it's not fulfilling their thought process. Well, I think they don't understand that, that it's not so much that black folks can't matriculate through Harvard and others, um, MIT or wherever it may be. Um, and graduate and graduate with honors is the fact that they got to get into that institution in the first place. Um, uh, and that's where the limit, a lot of the limitation comes in at. You are limited in terms of access to, to, to those particular entities that are supposed, uh, you know, reserved to be as the, uh, uh, the, the premier educational institutions. You know, that do not, in my opinion, and you guys can chime in, that do not necessarily educate um, their, the, the, the people that participate in them, matriculate in those schools. They don't educate, educate them on all of society. It just mainly discuss with them about one particular aspect of society, and that aspect is more European, white, non non-black for sure, um, <clears throat> you may have some other uh, non-black entities in there, but they primarily go toward uh, educating the European uh, from a European perspective. When, when you, you understand mm -hmm. that American history is incomplete, dishonest, and racist, and the little teaching of American history that's done in schools, it's it does not include truth as we would think of truth. It is a romanticized history. It is a history that makes it appear as if Europeans did everything. Right. Uh, and things that they did not do, they created to make it appear as if they did some of the things. And when we understand... When I was in school, my eighth grade American history teacher, Rutledge Pearson, said to his classroom, freedom is not free. If you're not a part of the solution, you are part of the problem. And he told us to take this eighth grade American history textbook approved for Negro students in this segregated Negro junior high school in Jacksonville, Isaiah Blocker, one of two, in the Negro division of the Duval County school system, take this textbook and leave it home. Because this textbook only included the names of two blacks 
George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington. George the only George two George. blacks included in the books. And he wanted to make sure that we understood and we knew those blacks who made salient contributions to American history, not just rely, relying upon racist textbook author historians who always will try to make sure that blacks either did not do a lot or whatever they, they did, white for white savior syndrome enabled them to accomplish whatever they did. So a lot of the names that we talk about, we hear today, we didn't hear about them. And we still, many of them don't, don't uh, know about them. Two quick things as we were talking about medicine. I can stand on the corner right now and ask black folk and white folk who Henrietta Lacks was, and they could not tell me. Uh, and yet here is a woman who changed medicine as we know it. And then thankfully within the last two or three years, uh, ben Crump and other lawyers were able to uh, help the family get money for the money uh, being paid for the money stolen from them. But when we talk about racism, there was a very iconic civil rights person in St. Augustine. His name was Dr. Robert Haling. And Dr. Haling was beaten uh, for whatever reason he decided he wanted to go and spy on a, a Ku Klux Klan rally, and they caught him spying. And like the old folk would say, they beat him to within an inch of his life. But his family did not want him to be treated in the hospital and by doctors in St. Augustine because they did not trust them. This was in the early 1960s. So a black funeral director put him in his hearse brought him to Brewster Hospital in Jacksonville to be treated by the black doctors at Brewster Hospital and Dr. Arnett Gerardo, who did his dental surgery, saving his life because of those black doctors. And we don't know that. We don't teach that. We don't understand that. And all of it revolves around the core racist attitudes and the racism that we deal with in this country that white folks say when we talk about it, makes them feel guilty and uncomfortable. If you did not do things to make you feel guilty and uncomfortable so that we would talk about it, then you wouldn't feel gu guilty and uncomfortable. Mr. Hirsch, you had, a, um, you had a conference, the Civil Rights Conference, inaugural Civil Rights Conference here in Jacksonville a couple of years ago. I attended. And in, in one of the sessions, we you you know, we had the breakout sessions. Right. I was I was, you know, I won't say surprised, but I, I, I was kind of surprised by the college students who said they learned more about our history than they ever did throughout their entire educational experience. College students who graduated, they were they had graduated from college, never heard of African Americans in the way that they heard of African Americans at that civil rights conference. That was amazing. They hadn't heard of, and I have to say it, Mr. Hurst, it was never, it was never about a hot dog and a Coke. If you, for those of you who've never heard that, how about enlightening our audience about it was never about a hot dog and a Coke? Um, downtown Jacksonville in the late 50s and into 1960, uh, had a number of department stores that either had a lunch counter one or had two lunch counters. And the second lunch counter was always the colored lunch counter. The, the department stores with one lunch counter, blacks could order food at that one lunch counter. They would have to go to the end of the counter stand because you could not sit down, order your food, and then wait until the waitress came to you to take your order and then wait until she later brought your food to you. And hopefully it was not hot food because by the time you got it, it would no longer be, be hot. Yet these stores invited you in to spend their money, to spend your money. 
and insulted you by saying, we want you to spend your money only where we want you to spend it. In February 1st of 1960, sit-in demonstrations started in Greensboro, North Carolina, started by black students from North Carolina a and HBCU in, in Greensboro. They spread throughout the South. Most of the sit-inners in the 30 or so cities that had sit-in demonstrations throughout the South were college students. In Jacksonville, we were high school students, 95 to 98% of us, inspired in part by my eighth grade American history teacher, who was also the advisor to the Youth Council in AACP, who encouraged us to join. So I joined at age 11, started school when I was five and I got skipped. And as my pastor say, favor ain't fair. So I'm 11 years old in the eighth grade. 15, I became president. 16, I led the sit-ins and we went to these stores that would not allow us to spend money at that white lunch counter, but said to us, you can spend money any place else you wanted to spend. And we said that was insulting and it was disrespectful. So we went in those stores, we went at one lunch, one counter and we purchased something, we went to the white lunch counter and they prompted throughout Jacksonville on that first day, August 13th, 1960, they closed the lunch counters. We sat in for two weeks. We saw no police. We had a white student to join us during this time frame, and whites white construction workers tried to grab him and assault him if it were not for black teenagers who put a circle around him and walked him out of the out of the store to Ashley Street and to safety. The press blacked out all news about the sit-in demonstrations. The Florida Times Union had a section in the newspaper called News for and About the Colored People of Jacksonville. And that's where all the black news was. No matter, there were four HBCUs within 150 miles of Jacksonville, it was still news for and about the colored people of Jacksonville. They made a conscious decision to black out all the news. Only the black press, not only in Jacksonville, but throughout the country, uh, carried the news about the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s the way it should have been carried. We sat in for two weeks on August 27th, 1960, we were attacked by 200 whites with axe handles and baseball bats after whites in Confederate uniforms passed out free axe handles in the park in the middle of downtown. After an FBI informant told me 40 years later that the Klan met in a downtown hotel to start a race war based on the sit-in demonstrations at that time. 40 years later, I found out that the National Guard was on standby in St. Augustine and also at Camp Blanding. They knew after the FBI informant did his report that something was going to happen that day, yet the Jacksonville Police Department, the Duval County Sheriff's, and the National Guard opted not to have a show of force to keep anything from happening. So the whites with the act handles not only attacked us, but attacked anybody black downtown. None of this was covered in the press, local press, only the Florida Star, only the Pittsburgh Courier with those black reporters that came in from the Pittsburgh Courier, that came in from the Chicago Defender, that came in from the Amsterdam News, only they covered the story. When I wrote, it was never about a hot dog and a Coke because we did not sit in at white lunch counters in these white racist stores to eat a sandwich and to drink a beverage. We sat in to demonstrate our opposition to racism, to the evilness and the vulgarity of their core racist attitudes and also for our black human dignity and respect. My book, I started off with it being a personal account as the president of the youth council leading the sit-ins. 
it has turned into a history book because there are things in my book that I have included in a firsthand account and my firsthand knowledge that you won't find anyplace else. Uh, so that's that's uh, the reason I I wrote the book. I wrote it out of anger, but uh, the bottom line is it has become the history book about the civil rights movement and the sit-ins in 1960. You know, I want to say this real quick because uh, uh, you brought up a subject matter that I actually experienced the same thing myself. I'm going to be quick about it. Uh, down in South Florida, in a town called Boynton Beach, uh, back then we had something called Roar Castle. It's kind of equivalent to the crystals of the day. Yeah. And we could not uh, go to the, we could only go up to the counter close as, as close as it was to the kitchen. You had to come through the kitchen, go in and order your food. Uh, at that part of the counter and wait for, you know, the food to be brought to you. You couldn't sit down and eat within the, the institution. And I was like a you know, a little young boy, could have been six, seven years old, somewhere in there. My mom sent me in because she was trying to treat us after a movie. And I said, I waited at that counter for close to an hour and a half to two hours. Mm. Never got served. Uh, wait on the waitress all that amount of time until my mom finally came in. And said, "Boy, what's taking you so long?" I say, "Well, I, nobody's waited on me." Say, "They haven't waited on you yet." I say, "No, ma'am." She said, "I tell you what, I don't need to spend, you know, I don't have to spend my uh, expletive deleted money right. for, to kiss somebody's ass." And That's right. and, and that was my experience, and it never left me. So when when you said that, Mister Hurst, it just reminiscent it reminds me of what I experienced as a little young young boy that didn't understand to a great degree at that time. But it made, I mean, I kind of like the, the fact that I experienced that because it made me the person I am today. Not saying I'm a great person. But, but. And, and white folk don't want those, they don't want those stories told. They were the ones right. who imposed racism. They were the ones who imposed mm -hmm. black codes and Jim Crow. They're the ones that initiated the American Christian uh, institution uh, called slavery. They started that to impose their will on persons who were different based on the color of their skin. Then when you tell them what their ancestors did to our ancestors, then they say, oh no, we don't want to talk about that because it makes us feel guilty and uncomfortable. We are not telling a lie. We're telling the truth. And it's unfortunate that our young people today will be educational cripples because they will not learn the truth about American history because white folk don't want their history told because their history is an evil, vulgar history and black history shines a spotlight on their racist history. You know, we're going to, um, uh, we're getting ready to do our black history moment, but I do want to say this real quick. When we come back, I want to ask you guys, you gentlemen, how do we move forward in terms of, 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 of addressing DEI with our youth today? Because that is a big issue. Uh, that is, uh, how do we uh, how do we move forward on that? And Ms. Turner, I know you're going to probably have some clarification to that point when we get back, but uh, you can go ahead and with the Black History Movement. To our weekly series on History Makers, Every Tuesday, we highlight a new history maker who has made significant contributions to society. Today, we are proud to represent Carter G. Woodson, whose dedication to celebrating the historic contributions of black people led to the establishment of Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson was a scholar whose dedication to celebrating the historic contributions of black people led to the establishment of Black History Month, marked every February since 1976. Woodson fervently believed that black people should be proud of their heritage and all Americans should understand the largely overlooked achievements of black Americans. Woodson overcame early obstacles to become a prominent historian and author of several notable books on black Americans. Born in 1875 to illiterate parents who were former slaves, Woodson's schooling was erratic. He helped out on the family farm when he was a young boy and as a teen worked in the coal mines of West Virginia to help support his father's meager income. Hungry for education, he was largely self-taught and had mastered common school subjects by the age of 17. Entering high school at the age of 20, Woodson completed his diploma in less than two years. 
Woodson worked as a teacher and a school principal before obtaining a bachelor's degree in literature from Berea College in Kentucky. After graduating from college, he became a school supervisor in the Philippines and later traveled throughout Europe and Asia. In addition to earning a master's degree from the University of Chicago, he became the second black American after W.E.B. Dubois to obtain a Ph.D. degree from Harvard University. He joined the faculty of Howard University, eventually serving as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Black History Ignored After being barred from attending American Historical Association conferences despite being a dues-paying member, Woodson believed that the white-dominated historical profession had little interest in black history. He saw African-American contributions overlooked, ignored, and even suppressed by the writers of history textbooks and the teachers who used them. For black scholars to study and preserve black history, Woodson realized he would have to create a separate institutional structure. With funding from several philanthropic foundations, Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915 in Chicago, describing its mission as the scientific study of the neglected aspects of Negro life and history. The next year, he started the Scholarly Journal of Negro History, which is published to this day under the name Journal of African American History. Black History Month Woodson's devotion to showcasing the contributions of black Americans bore fruit in 1926 when he launched Negro History Week in the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Woodson's concept was later expanded into Black History Month. Woodson died from a heart attack at the age of 74 in 1950. His legacy lives on every February when schools across the nation study black American history, empowering black Americans and educating others on the achievements of black Americans. Throughout his life, Woodson published many books on black history, including The A Century of Negro Migration, 1918, The Education of the Negro Before 1861, 1919, The History of the Negro Church, 1921, and The Negro in Our History, 1922. Wow, thank you, uh, our behind the scenes technology guy. He really pulls from our history. And by the way, to both of our guests, in the past, one of our former guests, Anita Spencer, always told us every time she came on the show, we shouldn't expect for someone to educate us about our history. We should educate ourselves about our history, but also talk about the notable achievements of our own family, so our own circle of, of friends. Dr. Jones, I know Dr. Kane asked a question, but I want to pause for a moment to, to come back to you because you, you know, you, you have some dialogue with us via text and email prior to, um, prior to today's podcast. There are a couple of things that, that you wanted to bring up. Would you, would you like to share those now? I know you had a lot. Oh, that, you, you know, you, I was you know, reading, I was reading that whole response and the, the comments by uh, Musk regarding the, the Boeing issue with the bolts not being on there. And he blamed that on DEI. So I went to the company that was doing building the air, aircraft body. They have so little or none African-American participation in that company that it's Caucasians who are number one, Latinos number two, Asians number three. They In their demographics that they publish, they didn't even have enough blacks to publish a percentage. Yeah. So that was not put together by us. Same thing with Boeing. In the engineering department, Boeing may have 3% African Americans. Yeah. So it is imperative that people understand that African Americans have now become the boogeyman in American history and in American politics. They feel if you're black, you're not educated. And that is something we work on internally by educating our children. Because when they see you black, if you're tall or if you're a big burly guy, you're either a football player or a basketball player. They can never see you as a physician, a lawyer. Uh, engineer, a CEO, 
That's never the concept. And that concept is, is never, and that's what I say, when you manage television and you look at television, every major black show circles around a family with drugs, somebody just got out of jail. That's their impression of black people. And we, that is something internally the African-American community has to deal with for ourselves, not for them, or not to please anyone else. We have to take back the education of our, our kids back within the community. We have to build that purpose. And even if you look at local television, you only hear about Reigns and Rebalt or Jackson if there's somebody shot nearby or they're playing basketball or football. You never hear about the science when they get inducted to the science, you know, National Honor Society or the science. You never hear <laughs> it. It's like those things do not exist within the African-American diaspora in the United States. So I think that it's imperative that, as Brother Rodney said, we have to take control of who we are. We have to educate. You know, here's Black History Month. We may have to do the education of our kids right. in these African-American churches on the weekends. Right. We may have to start teaching SAT, PSAT, math, science, language, all those things we have to look at and say we have to do it because the school system is not doing it. Right. And I don't care who they put to run the school system. That's right. Their goal is to sit you there for whatever hours it is. I don't know what's how long. School used to be eight hours. I don't know. It's not eight anymore. But we have to educate ourselves. So I think it's imperative that every Black person who can contribute start thinking of ways to contribute to the betterment of our children and managing them, teaching them self-control, teaching them how to love each other, because everything they see on TV is about black people killing each other. Yeah. So it, it takes more. And believe it or not, it's getting worse. Because if I, I and I think young people should look at I and the prize. Look at who was doing the who was doing the protesting. Yeah. Young, educated black students that were out there. Right. I mean, you ask these kids today to go protest anything. You know, some will go, but historically. And then the other important piece is supporting HBCUs. Yeah. We cannot yeah. overlook that. Thank you. Buddy. Every civil rights, you're just every joining civil us. rights. We're, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Hold on one second, Mr. Hurst. If you're just joining, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about the challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Join into the discussion. Dial in now, 888-669-1280. We have distinguished guests. Uh, Mr. Rodney Hurst and Dr. Kenneth Jones. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Hurst. Every civil rights movement in this country was started by young Blacks. Every civil rights movement in this country was started by young Blacks. Last year, we had the National Asala Conference here in town, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which is the successor to the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Year before that, when we had the Civil Rights Conference, the inaugural Civil Rights Conference, one of the speakers was a black doctor, PhD, from the University of Maryland at Baltimore College, Dr. Freeman Hrabowski, who was part of the Children's Crusade out of Birmingham, who was arrested at age 13, served three days in jail, but started STEM curriculum at UMBC. When the vaccine was discovered for the coronavirus, the young lady who was involved in leading the team that discovered that vaccine was named Kismekia Corbett black female who graduated from the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. And the first person she called when they discovered that vaccine was Dr. Freeman Herbowski, her president when she attended UMBC. We would not know that. 
We just think that it's something that happens. Yet when uh, we are starting, uh, we being a solid, it has already started in Southwest uh, Florida. They have started freedom schools where they're teaching black history on the weekends uh, in um, Sarasota, in Miami, in St. Petersburg, in Tampa. We'll start here in Jacksonville within the next two to three weeks teaching black history on the weekend because again, uh, Dr. Jones and Ms. Turner and, and Dr. Kane, we very naively thought that the oppressor would teach us our history and not talk about their history. Yet we have found that when we talk about our history, because our history is intricately bound to their history, yet our history tells the truth about what they did. You can't talk about slavery without talking about what happened to folk and how they were treated and how they tried to escape from slavery and what happened to them. And the question is, who enslaved them? Who beat them with whips? Who put them in chains? And yet that's what made white folk feel guilty and uncomfortable. Who fought a war to maintain slavery? And every religious, every white religious denomination supported slavery. Well, no, wait a minute, Mr. Hurst, the, the Pilgrims and the Quakers and every white religious denomination supported slavery. Georgetown College, founded by Jesuit priests, now Georgetown University. In 1838, they got in trouble keeping the doors open. And these Catholic priests sold 273 of their enslaved persons to keep the doors of Georgetown College then, now Georgetown University, open. Every Ivy League college president owned enslaved persons. Every Ivy League college had buildings and infrastructure built by slaves. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded in 1845 in Augusta, Georgia for the sole purpose of supporting slavery. So when you talk about religious, all religious didn't do that. The big wink, nod, nod that white religions did, they considered us property. They called, they considered every person with a dark or black hue of skin property. Therefore, they did not have to treat them as human beings to get around the teachings of Jesus Christ and the teachings in the Bible. And that's what this country was based on. And that's what white folk don't want taught because that's what makes them feel guilty and uncomfortable. Well, remember, if you're looking at history, again, never forget the Supreme Court did what? What is Dred Scott all about? That's right. If you understand history and know what the Dred Scott decision was all about, you'll understand what happened. That's it right. took till 1965. Think of when Dred Scott was, 1870 something? Not until 1965. Yeah. That and then what happened? What did Lyndon Johnson say when he signed that? The Democratic Party has lost the South for generations. So all of those Southern segregationist Democrats are the new Republicans. Sure. It's all about history. And that is one of the things why I think people need to understand, you know, when one looks back at somebody who had a similar past, is recent, but they did bad things, Nazi Germany. But they teach it in their schools that it will never happen again. Right. They, you know, he was charismatic. He had people, people sat back in retrospect and said, how could all these highly educated people follow this man? Well, it's 2024. And you see it. We see do we see a parallel understanding history?
that's what's important. You know, what I want to ask is, um, and both of you gentlemen, you can tell me, you know, one of the things that bothered me early on, way back in the early 20s when J, uh, 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 um, Jeb Bush was here in Florida, but this went around the nation, was the 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 movement of 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 moving public and moving educational education from public to private yeah okay and the, i'm gonna ask you guys to in your opinion to elaborate on what you thought or what you think occurred when you had that transformation of having so much of our education being provided by public school, I mean, by private school, you know, taking away, and I look at the tax dollars and the, all the other efforts that were spent, uh, or could have been spent on public education, public school education, being taken away by private uh, school education. And I thought that that was a monumental error and, and, and mistake uh, as far as us not going out, as us, as mean, us meaning black folk, not going out and protesting that to the nth degree. Uh, and I knew it would come back, and I felt it would come back and haunt us. Uh, and but I'm gonna ask you guys what your thoughts on it. Well, well it was purposeful. Uh, white folk are still angry today with the Brown decision from 1954. They are still angry with that decision. And when you study school desegregation, the school desegregation plan uh, uh, case was filed in. 1960 by attorney Earl Johnson, NAACP attorney, on behalf of Sadie Braxton's two and, and her two children, Daley Braxton and Sharon Braxton. The school system spent $800,000 in the intervening 10 years before there was a school desegregation plan in 1970. And that plan put the total burden of school integration on the backs of black students and their parents. It closed all of the graduating centers. Uh, it closed Gilbert, it closed Stanton, it closed Northwestern, it closed Douglas Anderson. All of the graduating centers, the two black junior high schools, Isaiah Block and James Weldon Johnson, and they included in the philosophy of the Duval County school desegregation plan that it would be beneficial for black children to leave the ghetto, actual language, and ride on a school bus crossing the St. John's River, perhaps for the first time in their lives, and going to school in the suburbs to see how their white counterparts live. That is actual language in the school desegregation plan that came out of the federal court of Judge Gerald Barr Choflat and the superintendent Cecil Hardest in Duval County school system. So the whole concept of then moving from public education to charter schools and taking private dollars and giving it to private schools through white parents still goes back to 1954 because white folk to this day, many of them are still upset about what happened with the Brown decision. Public dollars to private. Yes. Yeah. yes. Charter schools are private schools. They, well, you know, we are public charter. No, charter schools are private schools. And the money goes to them first most of your charter schools have relatively new plants, new facilities that they're either rented or, or purchased. Yet the, the Duval County school system with its school building stock being 20, 30, 40 years old, they have to wait until the charter schools get bricks and mortar money to improve their facilities before they can get money to improve theirs. And that, that, that is by design by racist legislatures throughout the South. I got it right there in my immediate neighborhood in, uh, in, in terms of where I work, uh, in my, my office with um, uh, uh, the, the public elementary school that they didn't want to put any more monies into. And then I, 
a hundred yards away, they got a private school that they put they put up brick and you know paid for the brick and mortar to build a private school. Well, but so it does not bring around full circle as far as my my thing is uh, with DEI because they're not the the and you can you guys can correct me if I'm mistaken. As far as DEI is concerned, those private schools that have no obligation or, or need to fulfill anything as it relates to that diversity, equity, inclusion, Not because they're private, right? Not at all. No, they don't. And just to add, the public school system has to take everyone, disabilities, you name it, the public school has to try and educate them. <coughs> Charter schools does not have to do, they do not have to do that. Nothing. They can be highly selective as to who they take. Right. And so it's not an even system. It's our tax dollars, but it's going. So the goal behind that in Tallahassee is to literally undermine public schools right. and have everyone go to charters. That's their ultimate goal. All right. So he here's what is really difficult. As we, as we craft this here conversation, and we've talked about a lot of things. Our focus has appeared to be on Black history. And as, as with the topic, how do we tie this in to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is where we wanted to, to lead our uh, viewers and audience today? I understand it's difficult to have any conversation about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion without talking about the history. But if either one of the two of you can can tie it all together for me, I would greatly appreciate that. Well, it's inextricably bound, uh, Mr. Jackson. Understand, uh, until 158 years ago, when slavery ended with the uh, end of the Civil War, it was against the law to teach enslaved persons how to read and write. So in 158 years, we learned how to read and write and educate ourselves. Racism is the basis for everything that we deal with in this country. And education is the battleground that we have not understood yet. Because when you control someone's mind, then you control their body and everything that comes after it which is one of the reasons why public education is such a, a standard that they want to cut down. If you start charging people for education and they have to use their disposable income to send their children to school, and we don't have that kind of disposable income, then we will have a population of others who would not be educated. It's just like going to college. A lot of black kids don't even think about going to college. A lot of their parents don't think about going to college because of the cost when colleges should be free. So if you turn around and make public education from grades from uh, pre-K through 12, when you charge an additional amount of money for them to go to what was here before public school, how many black families will be able to pay for their kids to go to school. And that's where we are going. And that's where public education through charters that they're calling private, private education, that's where it will take us. So much for diversity, Dr. so much for equity, I'm and sorry. so much for inclusion. <laughs> well, and, and as, Dr. As we Jones, I was thinking about, um, Dr. Jones, let me, I wanted to ask you before you, and you may be saying that now, but as Mr. Hurst was talking, I was thinking about you know, if 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 diversity, equity, inclusion goes away, and you talked earlier about not having that black folks' health is better when there's if diversity, equity, and and folks can to send their their kids to college to become a doctor or a lawyer, then who you see what I mean? No, that's when the systems then start to break down for us, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, what one has to remember is when people hear DEI, they focus on, in their minds, they're saying uneducated Black people taking my job or taking my place right. in college. Absolutely right. not. 
I mean, and I would I would stand on a on a soapbox and I'll say, when we get into college, we're very good. So that should go away. <laughs> but it has been the way DEI has been programmed in the minds of non-blacks is that somebody's making a way for people who are not qualified. And that is furthest from the truth. Because if you're black and you get into, they don't give up, as I tell people, there's no black math test. There's no black physics test. There's no black writing test. It's the test. You can't pass it, you're not getting in. You're not passing it, you're not graduating. So people need to get over this. And you saw what happened recently with Harvard. Who sued? Right. It wasn't the Caucasian community who sued. It was the Asian community. Somehow now when they see black people, they're saying, I know an Asian that should be in your spot. So they went and sued Harvard. Okay? So the data just came out from University of Penn, now that we're talking about anti-Semitism. They're saying there are more Asians now at Penn than they are Jews. We knew this was not going to stop with black people. That's right. It's going to start tapping into everything. Who benefited most from diversity, equity, and inclusion? Caucasian women. Yeah. So are they going to start feeling the blunt of this? So when the Supreme Court made that ruling, this group of ultra-conservative, multi-rich, you know, multi-ultra-conservative you know, Caucasian billionaires who are attacking this in every way possible, if they're saying, open the doors, let's recruit black people or the people we have not been recruiting in the past, because I guarantee you they're going to HBCUs and getting great grades and getting PhDs. That's who they're trying to get. They're not trying to get people who are not qualified. <clears throat> so we have to understand what DEI is in 2024. It's Willie Horton in the 70s. They're going to throw it up everywhere. L listen to the what was going on in our state. Silicon Valley Bank went under. What did the governor of this state say? It's because they were focused on DEI. They did right. not have any black person on their black management work. team. Not a <laughs> single one. And the right. bank went under. Right. Somehow, anything that goes bad, they say it's DEI. Boeing didn't. What do we uh, do know, about it, Doctor Jones? But and what do that we do? is why the black community has to address that. We have to start putting up our highly, in, you know, our people that are making important strides. We have to start educating, as Brother Rodney said. Our Saturday mornings, you know, all those churches with all those big buildings. We should be on a forceful education process. Get our young people and teach them how to read. Because those other people are not going to teach them how to read. We have to teach them the math. We have, I mean, that is something the community has to take on. And we also, uh, Ms. Turner, we have to make sure that our young people understand how important it is to vote. Absolutely. How important it is to it is so interesting when you look at the strategies when white folk, especially white Republicans, know that they cannot win just based on numbers. Then they start orchestrating the gerrymandering of districts to make sure that they have numbers. And all of a sudden now you begin to see in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and in Tennessee and in Florida, how they have gerrymandered Oklahoma in at least 27 states, how they have gerrymandered their legislature, which in turn allows them to gerrymander the co congressional seats so that there is just a slight difference by accident for Republicans when the majority of this country is not Republican and they would want to have a different reflection of the philosophy in Congress, if our young people understand nothing else, they should understand that democracy revolves around the ability to vote. Uh, and as corny as it sounds, people died literally uh, to vote for voter registration. 
uh, Charlie Cobb, who's a good friend of mine, who is a founder of one of the founders of SNCC, uh, National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame, a Carnegie Fellow in 1964. He put together a number of programs to work on voter registration in the state of Mississippi. In 1964, there were more black residents in the state of Mississippi than white, 1964. Only 6% of blacks in the state of Mississippi were registered to vote. Where was Medgar Evers killed and why was he killed? Right. Uh, 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 Harry T. Moore and his wife Harriet. Yes, in, right, in, right here in, in Florida, uh, Mims, Florida, because of voter registration. Vernon Dahmer in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, head of the state NAACP, because of voter registration. Uh, you look at some of these great marches, the march from uh, Selma to Montgomery was for voter registration. When Viola Liuzzo was killed, it was because of voter registration. When the three civil rights workers were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi, it was because of voter registration. White folk have spent their waking moments trying to keep black folk from voting. And that when we sit back and say, I'm not going to vote, our vote is not important, Oh, I don't think that he's done as much as he should do, so I don't think I'm going to vote for either <coughs> one of them, which is absolutely stupid. Yeah, you know, the question I've always had about that argument is, what's good for the geese is often good for the gander. Why is it we continuously speak about what they do when they are in opposition, but our party, our group, don't do the same thing. Because we don't know any better. Because we are ignorant. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, in, that's inefficient. Because the men and women, hold on, the men and women who are, who, who are in politics that are Democrats have the same education, same understanding of the way politics works as the Republican. So how is it then that there's never a reversal of that of what you just described with the Republicans when we're when the the odds are stacked against the Democrats that we put they pull together and put legislation and 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 force the changing of the lines. Why is it always that one direction and not the other? I think You've had some of it has to be a barbershop. You've had the conversations where black folk come up with reasons why either they're not going to vote or they are black Republicans. Why would any black person in this country want to be a part of the Republican Party? Lincoln is no longer the standard bearer, and that happened over 160 years ago when he freed the slave. So why would you want to be a part of the party that has given you Ron DeSantis and given you Donald Trump and given you Marjorie Taylor Greene and a host of other racists? You walk like a racist and talk like a racist, you are a racist. Why would you want to be a part of that understanding the history of what the Republican Party is doing against and to black folk today? Because you've just answered that. You've just answered that question by taking the time to orchestrate what the Republicans do in order to assure the, the, the continuation of the Republican Party. When you say that at the same time, you're saying that the Democrats, in essence, do nothing. But your explanation immediately goes to the voters and to the people. But I'm talking about the, no, the, I'm not the, saying the they do nothing. Politicians. I'm talking about the politicians. No, I'm not saying they do nothing. I am saying that what Republicans are doing is not met by black folk who are willing to do the things necessary to make sure their votes are counted and their voices are heard. I and think one of the things that the difference with what I see here, 
uh, I mean, what you both are saying is, Tyrone, one of the things that, uh, first of all, black folk, I mean, anybody, they know uh, uh, history. When you know your history, then you understand what has happened to you and you can appreciate better what you need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again. And or that if it worked the first time in, in terms of Republicans, they can repeat the same old playbook and keep doing the same thing if they thought it was successful the first time around. What we doing as Democrats, um, based on what you're in, in response to what you're saying, versus what the Republicans are doing, they are holding their representatives accountable. They are out there, they're out there, they decide to vote, they decide to go and participate in the process and make sure that their voices are heard within their party. We're not doing that, I think. What a lot of us are not doing that as, as it relates to the Democrats, as it relates to um, the, um, the young, I'm gonna say young folks, but whomever, we're not going out and holding those guys accountable. We're not looking at long-term planning like those Republicans. That didn't happen overnight with that whole gerrymandering deal with mm -hmm. those Republicans. It didn't happen overnight. They did some long-term planning to decide that they want to manipulate uh, the electoral college as it relates to uh, the gerrymandering aspect we're talking about. They did long-term planning and made sure that they expressed and got the people in that they wanted to do their job. We're not doing that. We just wait and see who gets elected. You know, we're not looking at local elections as much as we should, or, you know, statewide elections, whatever it may be. All we want to run out there every, in my opinion, we want to run out there every four years and vote for the president and think that that person is the one that's supposed to be making all the difference in the world, but we're not participating in those people that we're asking to immediately represent us. But that's, a, that's an inadequate people. argument by my view. By my view, that's an inadequate argument because they're way more illiterate and uneducated uh, white people that these Republicans are reaching. And you're going to tell me, we just went through this here. We talked about- But if they uh, vote, uh, Tyrone, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones did an excellent vote. job of telling us that when we go to college, we do, we do exceptionally well. So no matter what field we're in, we learn that field, we do well in that field. So if we've gotten into politics, one of the responsibilities of politics is to reach the people. What I hear from both of you is that they, the Republicans have found a way to reach the people. They're illiterate people. And then the Demo and then the, I know what I'm saying. Then the Democrats have not found a way to reach. How the illiterate people. people? You think we don't have illiterate people in the, in well, the Democrats? Well, you know, let me let me say this in response to Tyrone is the fact that you hit on it. It's who we are electing. Okay then. Okay. We're saying so, that. When you send someone up there and you support them, you have to hold their feet to the fire. You never hear from them. You never hear them introducing bills. You never, I mean, these are important things and it's part of the education process. We may have to go back in the old days where a lot of it was done in the churches on the weekends where people figure out and say, look, who is best for the community? We're supporting, you know, person A, B, C, or D. Because many times we don't get the best support, the best people running, because the really bright people are busy doing what they're doing, trying, you know, and doing other things. So within the, the as you, you know, you want to say within the party that's not Republican, the Republicans go for the long game. They plan it out. They're not worried about this election cycle. They're looking down the road three and four cycles down. A lot of the Democrats, when you listen to them speak, it's about now, what's happening right now. And what are we going to do now? Now may be short-lived. Well, I'm going to tell you, this conversation obviously can go on. I'm going to punt this here to uh, Miss Jocelyn Turner and uh, and let her get involved in here. Because as we have we slowly uh, crept past the end of the show, and she is obviously enthralled in the conversation because... She would have she would have said something by now. So, Miss Johnson, it's on you. But look, I'm gonna say but one I, thing. Why isn't somebody as good as Miss Turner? But Miss Turner, just let me say this. Why isn't somebody as educated and as good as Miss Turner run for one of those positions? 
those are the kind of people. Oh my, I felt put on the spot then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so listen, I would like to ask one question. I know we're well beyond the the seven thirty hour, and I appreciate our guests for staying on, and to our viewers who are also still tuning in. I do have to ask a question though, because there are people who lead organizations right now. They are feeling threatened because of potential loss, but they have DEI practices in place. What do you say to them to, to stand firm and hold on? We, you know, we're still going to support you. I mean, what do you tell them they want to still have a diverse population of of employees or staff because the people they serve are are also uh, diverse and they want to make sure that as dr jones said earlier that the people who are being seen are being seen by people who look like them what what, what advice would you give them i said to continue Knowing doing that, that's what you're doing don't be intimidated by did you hear jamie diamond's response the other day you know he runs one of the biggest banks what does he say i'm not intimidated by anyone who attacks my DEI process, it's gonna keep going. And more people have to stand up like that and said, we are doing this because our clientele is a diverse clientele and I need to put people out there that can get me more business. It's all about money. If you pull away your DEI process and it affects the, the bottom line, you'll see how fast these people flip. Put it right back, back to having DEI. So it's about financial support. Look at companies. All the companies who bailed on DEI, do you, should you spend your money with them? We have to become a more educated community fiscally. And that is something, as I said, it goes back to things that Rodney and them are doing and people in the community about educating and what do we do and why we should educate. We have to educate. And we also have to stay away from the criminal justice system because you see how quick they like to hit these young brothers with felonies. What happens when you get a felony and you come out? In Europe, you, you get all your rights back. You can vote. What happened in the state of Florida? No. No. Exactly the point. Do you know when Barack was running, how many guys I ran into as we were doing canvassing and trying to pick people up the day up and tell them to vote. I mean, I would say six out of 10 meant to me, I can't vote, man. I, I, I'm a felon. I mean, that was so frequent that I'm like, you know, the person I was with at the time, I said, man, I didn't know it was that pervasive. Yeah. yeah. So again, we have to stay out of the criminal justice system because and, if they and, load and you there in also there, people who do. Yeah. And there are also people who need to stand up now before elections and work with people to get their rights restored. Absolutely. I know there, Absolutely. Was, there was a restoration that, of yeah, rights. In the past. That is another yeah, thing. I we know, be uh, on. Who's doing it? Right. I do not yeah. Know. And the Rodney, do I'll you call him. I'll call him. Uh, I'll call him. Yeah, the past. I know. I'll wait with him on that. Yeah, I know the NA, the state NAACP and national NAACP are working on and still have some suits pending. The, the other thing, we have to um, expect executives and CEOs in some of these companies to show some degree of bravery and courageousness. Uh, interestingly, this white female new mayor of Jacksonville appointed an aide in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the city council said, oh, well, we don't know whether or not we're going to appropriate money for her, except the thing is the mayor can reallocate 10% of the budget of the city of Jacksonville. And she told me he's not going anywhere. That aid will still be there. Coming together doing a Martin Luther King breakfast that's DEI, getting together to show that you're going to appoint Blacks in different positions because of who they represent. That is DEI. Businesses that want my money, they need DEI to assure 
that black folk are going to continue to spend money with them. If they give up on DEI, then we give up on buying their product. We give up on them. Or banking with them. Yes. Yes. We give up and, on them. And that's the bottom line. And one of the things, Tyrone, you talked about uh, what we need to do and why people don't say some things. Black folk have rewarded mediocrity many times mm -hmm. when it comes to our elected officials. We have not required them to stay on the case, both national, state, and local government. I agree. Uh, and, and, and you are you can join whatever party you want to join. We got three black Republicans on the city council in Jacksonville who dance to the Republican music. Yep. That's ridiculous. Now, my, my point is, while acknowledging they can do whatever they want to do, but their party line does not support, nor does it envelop, nor do they put their arms around black folk because the philosophy of the National Republican Party, the state Republican Party, and the local Republican Party is anti-black. So we need to make sure that we understand, like we have boycotted things before. I'm not advocating it. NACP called it selective buying program. We decide where we're going to spend our money, where we're going to bank, where we're going to shop, where we're going to do different things. We can decide that. And if you decide that you don't want to support me, then I decide I'm not going to support you. Simple. Now, one of the questions that I think Ms. Johnson asked Liz is how do we get youth involved it may have been you dr King. how do we get the youth involved as i listen to you uh, uh mr hurst you said that if you look in history the, some of the greatest strides for the civil rights and, and movement has been at the behest of young uh young adults so it appears that we should have some kind of collective effort to get that group involved but when you look at the process of voting, the process of disseminating information, and the way the information is disseminated, it is specifically designed to exclude a generation. And you're saying to me that it's the generation that is can affect the greater change. One of the problems that we have is that as much as we should be, the black community is not monolithic. Mm. So when we should be marching arm in arm downtown for things that are good for all of us, for one of us or all of us, we are not because many of the many of us black folk internalize and put together our own little apple cart for ourselves in terms of to what degree we can personally benefit based on our relationship with white folk. And we have done that since slavery. So the, the, the key now is that you let those persons do whatever they want to do and leave them out there, but you make sure that people understand what their options are. Many times they don't understand their options. Even when they understand the options, we have to let them know what the, their options are over and over. We need to talk to our ministers to make sure they start saying from their pulpit some of the things that needs to be said, which includes your ministers too, not you individually, but all of us that attend church and we have ministers, our ministers need to say some things from our, from their pulpit and they are not saying them. All right, well, Miss Jocelyn, and also, I um, feel this is also, show, yeah. this is a, oh, this, I was about to say, this is a show that is obviously can go on and on. And I love it at the time when Ms. Johnson say, we are definitely gonna have to have you gentlemen back. This is a part two show if I've ever heard one, but I'm not gonna be the deliverer of that. Ms. Jocelyn, I'll let you do what you do so well. Well, actually I, I had just one other comment and <laughs> would like for our guests to talk about it before we wrap up the show because you know earlier today we were talking about policies that are currently pending legislation in here in our state so when we you know we we really need to make sure that those weekend those saturday conversations include what's happening in tallahassee right now 
not just who's running for office, but what conversations having in Tallahassee right now, what policies are they putting in place in order for to, to, to people? I mean, for me, the one thing that has been, as my niece says, grinding my gears is people are arguing or paying attention to what pronoun I refer to myself as, right? But yet, I see people lined on the streets of here, here in Jacksonville who are homeless. People who Dr. Kane might be seeing in his practice who have medical issues <clears throat> who are threatening to be evicted from their homes. So tell me how you can live on the streets, how you can live in your car and manage your chronic health conditions and all elected officials want to argue about or put out there in the news to focus our attention on is what pronouns we to ourselves at. I mean, the real issue, and I'm sorry, and Dr. Kane, I'm surprised you hadn't said it. I was waiting that the people <laughs> we elect, and Dr. Jones, you kind of alluded to it. The people that we elect sometimes look like us. They're not doing the job that we need them to do, and we need to start holding not just who look like us, but all people who come ask us for our votes, we need to hold them accountable and talk about the issues that really matter to us. And I'm sorry, we're just not doing it. What your name I, is, who you are. Go ahead, Dr. King. I, I, I did it somewhat tangentially because I've done it so many times <laughs> in the past. I referenced it, but in all honesty, you know, don't bring me some damn fried chicken and watermelon and think, you know, about two days before the election and think that I should vote for you just because you brought that and you, you and, and you look like me and that you brought that fried chicken and watermelon. What are you doing? What did you do? OK, to earn my vote this time around? I'm on a whole. I want you to be held accountable every election, whatever fish it is. It is, whomever it is, I've had officials that have been friends of mine, but I still held them to the same level of accountability that if they did not fulfill what was best for the people and not for what was best for their pocketbook, they as need to go. It's yeah, true. that's it. You're talking, you're talking monumentally high. You're talking, when we're talking about the everyday man and woman, what you're talking about how that this point, point, I'm, well, I'm going to say at this point is beyond their comprehension. You're asking me to be an everyday person and have the, the life and challenges that I have, but have a memory long enough to remember what a person told me two years ago and didn't do another two years. The, 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 the challenges of my life do not allow me that luxury. Now, when I hear these things, what I hear is there is a group of people who have the time, money, inclination who are not participating, and we need to get more involved. But when you're talking to the guy who's working at 7-Eleven and um, he is, is, can barely pay his rent and take care of things, and though he or she has the right to vote, you want them to have a memory long enough to, to support that? That's they don't need a memory, Tyrone. All they got to do is look at the moment. They look at the moment and see where they are. You don't need a memory for that. No, the you moment know, is, exactly the moment is where do I get my next supper? The moment is, how do I feed my kids? The moment is, how do I make it to tomorrow? And how do you, you ask that question in terms of politics and what you're addressing? How, how are you going to answer that question? You're going to look back and see what has or has not been done? Or are you just going to, I mean, how do you expect that question to be answered? But Tyrone, this goes to number two, strategies. Because, I believe in that, yes. Because I, I, I'm, I'm such a focused education person that if you were so disenchanted with a school system that wasn't designed to educate you, 
and you leave early and you have no skill, what are you going to be doing at 20, 30, 40, 50? Many of these people don't even have Social Security because they never had a good, solid job. Do you know what your life is going to be like? You wouldn't qualify for Social Security. So what, you're going to work until you're 99? <laughs> it's not going to happen. Right, so but you're saying, that's what I'm saying. That, that, it's a process that we as a community have to say, what's the good? What You know, you think of all those brothers back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They had a long vision. They said, if we're going to be better, we have to start our own schools, educate our own people. So we'll have educated people to continue educating us, make schools and environments of learning so cohesive and so great that we can educate a group of people. Then we got desegregation. We didn't get integration. We got desegregation. Two different words. And you get people who are disenchanted with school. They're out of school. And then what's happening? They can't get a good job. Now, I'm not saying there are not jobs available now paying okay salaries. They're the Amazons and the people like that. But Amazon can't even find enough workers. We have, what, 4.8 million jobs open in this country and people can't fill them? Yeah, so, I tell you I mean, what. I'm I just, big, I, I'm, I'm, big, I'm inadequate you to know, explain. It's a big, big problem. I'm inadequate to explain because there's a picture that I hear that is missed. I want to take your example that you just talked about. My stepfather, who raised uh, us as a family. Now, if I'm going to use the history, he dropped out of school in the sixth grade. He was functionally illiterate, but he managed to get a job that paid enough to raise five kids. Okay, so now, so so now. This is what you just gave me. And I'm saying yeah, that but that's the historical. Exact... historical. You can't do that today. Not in today's environment. Absolutely. You, got you to can't, create you can't do it in today's education. society. But what people see, there's an adjustment period for what they see, what they grew up with, what they saw to be true, and their understanding of reality today. And until we as a people can address the reality of today, we forever have a challenge. The question I ask everyone that I have with this here, because I hear these often, is how do we get to where we want to be from where we are, not where we ought to be? And, the, and that's when I get fewer answers. I get fewer, I get fewer positive retorts because. We know where we should be. We know what we should have learned. We know what we need. Yet, I need to get to the future. I can only go from where I am. Uh, but if you think this is the first time that that question has been asked, Tyrone, we have 400 years of that same question, those same issues being addressed by your forefathers. And, and historically, if you go back and look at your history, you see how they move forward on it you know so it, you just can't you, you can't tell me to go back and look at my history and you spent 30 minutes in this year to show telling me how inadequate the history that was taught to me was so 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 long my father didn't teach me the history i didn't get the history in uh in school i didn't get it in church and you and i both know i didn't get it through osmosis so where do i get it from you go out there. And if you didn't get it, do you? Do, are you having some now? Are you getting some now? You went out and saw well, it. Right? You know, again, we must learn. As Rodney said, we have to take back educating our children. That our is the one thing I, I believe in. That is most definitely. We have to so get on the board and educate our children. So it's because almost eight o'clock. The only way they can start the businesses, they can become the CEOs of their own right. businesses that they start, hire other black people, circulate the money within the African American community. That's what builds communities. Create the plan, and, and you and, said and that. You said that, Dr. Jones. So listen, this has been a hearty conversation, and as Tyrone says, we could go on and on, but we like to be respectful of our guests and our viewers. And hopefully you all gain from this, if nothing.
start your own sidebar conversation. You know, the when the Super Bowl happens, they're going to be those Monday morning quarterbacks. Be the Monday morning quarterback or the water fountain, whatever that thing goes, around the water fountain tomorrow at work. And, and continue this discussion because obviously we didn't finish tonight. We just touched on it. This is the beginning of Black History Month. This is a, a great way for us to start the conversation by talking about the challenges of DEI. We always like to give our guests an opportunity to, uh oh, sorry, it has something to fall. Always give our guests an opportunity to share their final thoughts regarding tonight's topic. Mr. Hurst, I'll start with you. What are your final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience regarding the challenges of DEI? And, you know, moving forward, what, what can folks do? Go ahead, Mr. Hurst. Dr. Jones. I, I think, uh, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Well, I, I think from my perspective, diversity, equity, and inclusion should always be part of the American fabric. But because historically people were excluded, not because of their knowledge, but just their skin color. We've got to keep remembering that. People act like this didn't happen. But it has happened. It has continued to happen. So we have to be inclusive with all people in America. Everybody should be a part of it. And my being here shouldn't make you think that I'm taking your spot. And that is where it all starts. From the Baki decision to the most recent Supreme Court decision against Harvard is that somebody thought that somebody black had the spot that belonged to them. So we have to continue to promote DEI and to show people that having an inclusive organization creates more value and they're more profitable and they deliver a product. Maybe if they had more black people, maybe those Boeing planes or those bolts would have been put on the right place. But you've got to remember, we were not there. But people are saying, because of DCI, that's why the bolts weren't there. But when you go and peel back the data, we're not there. So again, Wow. DEI works when everyone is included. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Tyrone, you you know, we must have struck a nerve because you came, you're usually the behind the scenes guy, but you came up front today. So what are your thoughts, final thoughts regarding tonight's discussion? Looks like we lost Mr. Mr. Hurst. We definitely need to get him back on. Yes, yes, I'll keep an eye out from. Well, first of all, uh, I want to thank our guests for coming on. It's always stimulating conversation, and uh, it's important that we give this kind of dialogue to our viewers and our listeners. As a closing, what I want to say is that it is important, um, in line with what Dr. Jones said, that we make it our personal mission, job, our whole dedication to educate our youth. It is within us the ability to elevate us as a people, but it must start at home. We went through several minutes where we talked about the inadequate <laughs> teachings, the, the, the systemic racism, the, the breach in the, uh, the DEI, and all these are things. And we fail in some places to remind our audience, our people, that it is our responsibility to educate one another until we become a class, a group, an organization, then we're always subject to another group, class, or organization. That's Thank you, Tyrone. Dr. Kane, what are your final thoughts? Well, you know, I go back to some basics of what I've said in the past. You don't know where you're going until you know where you're being. We have to make, understand, make sure that we understand uh, uh, what our history is, and it gives us, sometimes it can give us the, 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 um, 
uh, give us the, the, the plan on where we move from that point, how we move, give us an idea of what works, what does not work. Uh, we can sit back as much as we want to and look at, if, if I'm a youth, and look at what our parents did or did not do. My time here on earth is theoretically going to be much shorter than my kids are. So they have to look at what's best for their future and start looking at how to plan for their future, not wait for me to plan for their future. Okay, I've, I've lived most of my life. So my kids, they if they want to sit back and have a rewarding, as, as rewarding life as I have, then they have to assist in making sure that happens and not wait and not wait for me to do it for them. They are, uh, we, we have to move forward and hold people accountable for what they do, what they haven't done. We have to hold the ourselves accountable for what we do and what we haven't done. So if you don't go out, if you don't go out and vote for particular candidates, you have no room to complain about a damn thing. A vote, and I'm not saying what the right candidate is, but if you don't get out there and vote, you know, what do you got to complain about? You didn't have a word to sit in, you shouldn't have a word to say now. Thank you, Dr. Duquesne. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jones, for um, joining us. To, I know, again, it was a hard discussion for our guests. If you, you posted questions, sorry, we didn't get so uh, energized and enthralled in a conversation amongst ourselves, but uh, tune in again. You know, one of the, we've, we've tried to do our best to enlighten and educate people or at least have some conversations about things that that are relevant and used. Every week we feature um, a history maker, have our history maker moment at seven o'clock. We've been feeding at the end of our podcast a uh, bike business owner. So again, it's just our way of putting the information out there. Tonight, as you can see on the screen, the Rumlin Insurance Agency. We had um, Mr. Isaiah Rumlin on a few weeks ago in addition to someone who is the, has been the president of the local NAACP chapter, he's a business owner. And, and one thing I think Dr. Jones said tonight is we should, as a community, start working with our young people on the weekends, educating them, encouraging them, Dr. Jones, to be, to be the next surgeon on Edgewood Avenue here in Jacksonville, or the next primary care physician on Lim Turner Road, the next technology guru all over Jacksonville and Northeast Florida. We need to plant those seeds in our young people that they matter and that they are bright enough. And then we need to support the Northeast Florida Medical and other found foundation and other organizations that to award scholarships to young people make sure they have the opportunity once, you know, if, if academically they are in the college, unfortunately finances sometimes inhibit them from going. That's where the foundation, Northeast Florida Medical Society Foundation and other organizations are raising money and we've got to support them. You know, we'll go and spend money on so many other things, but we buy ticket to support their events and funders. So we really need to be careful and really think about where we're putting our money. And as, and as Dr. Jones said ago, don't spend your money where people speak publicly about why you shouldn't be present and or who make disparaging comments about bad things because Black folks are present, color, are a part of the organizations. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to the truth. Happy Black History Month. Tune in next week as we engage in more discussion. And as always, if you have any comments or opinions or thoughts about future topics, email us at info at pauseforthetruth.com. Good evening. Welcome to Pause for the Truth. We are grateful that you joined us today and hope you've gained valuable insights on our current topic. We look forward to having you with us next time as we explore trending issues in our community and discover ways to simplify life for you and your loved ones. Our dedicated panelists and staff are committed to sharing knowledge and serving our community. 
But now, we need your support. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and spread this valuable knowledge to others. Don't forget to invite your family and friends to tune in to our podcast every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. EST.